This is the execution chamber hall. And as you walk down the hall here to the execution chamber, this is a 24 hour holding cell. We bring that inmate down and hold him into the chamber there prior to the execution. At the appropriate time, he's brought down from the 24 hour holding cell and brought into the execution chamber where the electric chair is housed at. For almost a hundred years, the state of Alabama has used electricity to execute criminals. Once the inmate is brought down to be executed, he is placed into the chair. Once he's placed in the chair, the straps, leather straps are placed around him and they're tightened up real tight so there won't be any movement. This is where the electricity is generated from. It comes through these probes is inserted into the chair in this manner here. The, generate, the electricity is generated through the individual's head. It then courses through the individual's body, out his left leg, and completes a circuit. This man's heartbeat has been stopped by an electric shock. The only chance of restarting his heart is to give him a second controlled shock. He's had a good output on the way here. He's just arrested outside the doors. We've got something to run through this centre line. Okay. Tube's in the right place. Great. Okay, I'm just going to read through the paddles. Can you check a pulse? No pulse. VF on the monitor, charging to 200 joules. Stand clear. The central line's in, we'll have a milligram no of adrenaline, pulse. please. Yeah. Charges 360 joules. Stand clear. Can you can have a needle, please. Still no pulse. Still in the air, charging 360 joules. Will we stand clear? Yes, there's a pulse. Good Great. output. Excellent. The heart isn't directly stimulated by the brain. Unlike other muscles in the body, it has its own natural pacemaker, which sends out electrochemical impulses to create a regular beat. An electric shock disrupts the heart's pacemaker. In some operations, surgeons deliberately stop the heart from beating. The operation is going to be carried out using two types of electricity. We're going to use an alternating current, such as you get from the electric socket, which is going to stop the heart. We are then going to restart the heart using a direct current shock. Before the heart can be stopped, a machine takes over the function of the heart and lungs to keep the patient alive. Because the shock will be applied directly to the heart, the voltage is much lower than if it had to overcome the resistance of the skin. We're now going to apply an alternating current to the heart at 20 volts from about 10 milliamps. You can see as it's applied, the heartbeat stops and the heart begins to wriggle in an uncoordinated fashion. Normally the heart beats regularly. An AC shock sends the heart into spasm. The heart will remain in spasm indefinitely, which makes it much easier for the surgeon to operate. Rubber shock, then. Now we're going to make the heart beat again by shocking it with a direct current shock. Fire, please. Voila. A DC shock momentarily stops the heart completely. This allows the heart's pacemaker to resume its beat. The other muscles in the body also respond to electricity. If I touch this conductor, which is actually not live at the moment, but then make it live by gradually increasing the voltage on it from a piece of equipment that I have behind me, 
as I gradually turn the voltage up, I start to feel a slight tingling sensation in my hand. If I increase the voltage a little bit more, then my hand will start to quiver and then the muscles start to contract. And as that happens, my hand clamps down rather painfully onto the conductor. It's completely involuntarily. There's nothing I can do to unlock that hand. And so potentially that's a very dangerous situation if the current is flowing across from your chest from one limb to the other. And I'm going to switch it off now because it's jolly painful. There are continuous streams of electrical impulses travelling around the body, both coming up to the brain from the sensory systems, which allow you to feel things, and travelling the other direction from the brain back down to the muscles to control movement. These signals can be displayed on an oscilloscope. At the moment, my muscle is relaxed, so there's virtually no electrical activity in it whatsoever. If I choose to move my little finger, you can see there is a large amount of electrical activity there as my brain tells my finger to move. It just so happens that these electrical signals occur at frequencies that the human ear can hear, so you can connect them to a loudspeaker and actually listen to your muscles. Now that's quite a useful technique because doctors can have their ears trained to diagnose muscle disorders by listening to abnormalities in the sounds from muscles. One of the ways that we can detect if the nervous system has been damaged is to measure the speed at which electrical signals are travelling around the nerves. Here I've got conducting jelly which I'm applying to a pair of electrodes. And I'm now going to stick these electrodes over my ulnar nerve at the funny bone. The machine delivers a series of short electrical shocks to the electrodes at my elbow and causes my hand to twitch once a second when the shocks are applied. How quickly the signal passes down the nerve indicates how healthy the nerve is. Unfortunately, this technique can be very painful. We have, over a number of years, though, developed this new technique called magnetic nerve stimulation, which allows us to cause currents to flow in the brain without passing through the skin. It's very easy to demonstrate. I have a large coil here, which I can place centrally over my head. And when I stand on a foot switch, as you can see, I cause currents to flow in my brain, which triggers many of the muscles in the body, resulting in movement. And then, of course, we can record the signals from the muscle just as we did when we were electrically stimulating the nerve. Using electricity to diagnose illness is widely accepted. But electricity is also used as a treatment. Since the 30s, people have had electric shocks given to the brain, a treatment called electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. No one really understands how ECT works, but it's still used to treat people suffering from severe depression. The idea that electricity might be good for you has been around for a long time in medicine. People started trying it out in the 18th century, and then towards the end of the 19th century, somebody developed this device. <coughs> Oops, squeaks a bit. What happened with this was that you stood right inside it, completely insulated electrically, and when the current was passed in these wires, a magnetic field inside the cage induced currents inside the body. Now these machines were advocated for all kinds of complaints, for general aches and pains, for sprains, for generally feeling rather low, and even for constipation. And this electrode here was used for combing your hair. And it was supposed to cure baldness. Many of these historical beliefs about electricity haven't died out. They're still available in every high street. You can get treatments ranging from passive exercise to hair removal. There's no doubt that hair removal removes hair but it's not so easy to see if the other treatments work. A 
small DC current is very beneficial in two different ways when we do facial therapy treatments. The first, we use a negative electrode on the surface of the skin and we ask our client to hold on to the positive, completing the direct current circuit. The treatments appear to be highly scientific, but do they really work? At the moment, anybody can make and sell electromagnetic therapy devices, be they for cosmetic purposes or for actually treating diseases. There's no regulation on the marketing and advertising claims made for such devices. Drugs and such like are covered by the Medicines Act, but medical devices, so-called, are specifically excluded. This means that they do not undergo rigorous trials that prove that they work before they are sold. So I can make a gadget, claim that it cures migraine, herpes, anything I want, and advertise it and sell it, and the chances are I'll get away with selling it and make a lot of money for myself and not do the poor patient who's paid the money any good at all. It could be argued that much of the apparatus we actually use in professional beauty therapy isn't scientifically proven, but indeed many of the techniques and principles have their roots in the medical profession. We must remember when a client goes into a salon and begins a course of treatment, they want to improve or redress a certain condition. At the end of this course of treatment, if they feel better about themselves and feel much more positive, this is a very vital and important benefit. None of these treatments has a proven scientific background and that would be important if they were making any medical claims. And I think that much of the outcome of treatment in beauty salons relates more to the atmosphere of the salon, the physical treatment and the uh, relationship that develops between the beautician and the client rather than any actual uh, physical effect of these treatments. I really don't care to let my neighbors know exactly what's going on in here because a little information can be dangerous. Richard's experiments involve producing huge electrical charges, up to three million volts. The top of the machine cannot contain this charge and it sprays out in five meter arcs. It was invented 100 years ago by Nikola Tesla. Tesla was one of the world's great inventors. Among other things, he introduced us to radio, fluorescent lights and robots. But his most significant development was in direct conflict with another scientist of the time, Thomas Edison. Edison had developed the electric light bulb, then invested heavily in supplying direct current electricity to people's homes. Tesla suggested using alternating current. Direct current is a steady current, the same as you get out of a battery. Alternating current changes direction. Edison always referred to alternating current as the killer current, and he was determined to show that alternating current was dangerous, and to do that, he had neighborhood children collect pets, dogs and cats in the neighborhood that he took back to his laboratory and electrocuted with alternating current to prove that it was dangerous. And he went so far in this war as to suggest to the New York State Legislature that hanging should not be the way that criminals were executed, that they should be executed by the electric chair. And he invented an electric chair using alternating current to put the criminals in and to kill them. Tesla countered with his own propaganda including this photograph. In fact, it was a fake, using double exposure photography. It would be too dangerous to be near such a machine without protective clothing. In the end, Edison had to accept that alternating current had a significant advantage over direct current. There's a fundamental difficulty with transmitting direct current, and that is that over long lines, the electricity is slowly lost. The first user has plenty of energy. But as you move further down the line, less and less energy is available to the user. Where has this electricity gone? It has gone in the form of heat, heating the electrical lines themselves. Therefore, the electricity is not available to the end user on a long line. Using direct current, it would be impractical to get power to the top of a skyscraper. 
With alternating current, the loss in power can be overcome by transmitting it at very high voltages, then stepping it down to a safe voltage for the consumer. Direct current can't be stepped down like this. The local power utility has a distribution point located about six miles from my home. They distribute the voltage to the various neighborhoods at over 14,400 volts. That voltage is unusable in a home. It's just too dangerous. Therefore, they put on utility poles in small local neighborhoods utility transformers which step that 14,000 volts down to 240 volts for use within the local group of homes. In my case, there are four users, these three homes and my own. But Tesla had even more radical ideas. He wanted to use his coils to send electricity without wires. This tube has no wires connected anywhere on it yet it is receiving electricity through the air. We thought that there was something badly wrong with our equipment because it had already tripped a, an electrical trip switch in, in our rehearsal room five or six times before the night. We tried really hard to, to find out what was wrong and where it was and put it right, but. We hadn't been able to. It had been a, a really excellent night. We only had another two songs to go. Right towards the end of the gig, the, the guy accidentally hit the microphone stand with his strings. At that point, something went wrong with the electricity from his amplifier and it ran along all of his strings across his heart. And so he was killed immediately. He was actually dead before he hit the floor. Philip Handy was only 18. The current that killed him was too small to blow the fuse. A current of about 50 milliamps is enough to put the breathing muscles into spasm so that the patient stops breathing, and 100 milliamps is enough to stop the heart. A fuse is designed to allow several amps to flow before it melts. Its purpose is to prevent fires. It won't prevent electrocution. What does protect you is a residual current device, or RCD. Receiving an electric shock will still hurt, but the risk of electrocution is much less. All circuits have two connecting wires. The current flowing in each wire should always be the same. If you accidentally touch a bare wire, the leakage is immediately detected by the RCD, causing a switch to trip. If Philip Handy had been protected by an RCD, he would still be alive today. Everybody involved with that band and all the other bands I know have got little circuit breakers which you can take with you and plug in to your amplifier. Uh, even, if, even if you don't know if the building you're playing has got one, you can, you can just get one for yourself and plug it in anywhere, which we all do these days. But we didn't know about them then. <laughs>